Andrew, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. How are you? Uh, I'm not too bad, mate. I'm not too bad. I'm very busy. We're getting uh, we're getting all the last little niggly bits done for um for the tour in October. So it's just things like uh, you know making sure we've got all the merch and stuff there, making sure the band are all happy, getting riders and stuff sorted. So it's just a little behind the scenes stuff. All the major stuff's done. But I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thanks, and really looking forward to chatting with you. Of course, we just touched up a little bit off camera about how we could have done this another day, but uh, we're here now. And I understand it'll be a busy time for you getting ready to get back out on the road, but I bet you can't wait to do it. Oh, mate, yeah, yeah uh, massively excited. Um, obviously, the, the, the Newcastle show at the end of it's going to be like the sort of pinnacle. It's going to be my, my biggest headline gig. But uh, equally so, the other gigs and stuff, you know, it'll be the first time I've ever headlined in places like Bristol and Brighton and Southampton and stuff like that. And I mean, I haven't played those places. It's more so, Southampton will be the first time I've played there since 2019. So it'll be nice to go back to some of these cities. It'll be nice to go to a couple of new ones as well. Um, the majority of it's selling pretty well as well, which is good. So hopefully we're going to have a couple of packed out places. I think three or four of them are on the go on the cusp of selling out as well. So that'll be nice. Uh, but yeah, I'm 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 looking forward to getting back on the road. It's going to be a bit of a tough one with the boys because they're a bit of, you know they're a bit of a pain in the arse as most as most families are. Uh, that's kind of how I see the band. So it's going to be good. It's going to be a good test. But I think we're all looking forward. To it. We're all we're all raring to go. Uh, so yeah, uh, hurry up October. It's going to be a good one. And I'm looking forward to chatting with you more about that later. We'll definitely come to that. But first of all, the, the place I usually start with every guest that comes in, whatever profession they are, I'd just like to go back to when you were younger, Andrew, and ask where did it all start for you in music? Uh, okay, so I was um, I was about 18 when I first started doing music properly. I wasn't really interested as a, as, as a kid. I was more interested in football and kicking around with my yeah. pals and all that kind of stuff. I've... I, uh, I think I've told this story a few times. I, I've um, basically me 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 mom and stuff uh, was was the person who got us my first ever gig. I was I was skint at the house and I was um, I was doing plumbing at the time at uh, college. I didn't really have any interest in getting a job or anything. There. I was quite a lazy fuck, to be to be honest. And um, and my mom got us my first ever gig for uh, I think I made fifty quid for singing seven covers or something stupid like that. It uh, it's some work work night that she had on. And I think after that, I just fell in love with it, mate. As soon as I realised that I could make a little bit of money by singing the singing the songs and playing and playing on the guitar, um, I thought, yeah, let's let's try and give this a go. But again, they, they, they weren't original songs. I'd be singing Oasis covers and Neil Young and Bob Dylan and all that kind of stuff. And then it all changed about my second or third gig. It was my first ever gig in Newcastle. I was supporting a band called Oasis, and a guy who's now my manager, Lee, uh, he knew Noel Noel Gallagher from early 2000s, late late 90s sort of thing. And um, and I hadn't seen Lee for, for quite a while. I used to be a mate with him through football. And he took a video of Waiting for the Rain. It was the only original song I used to sing around about that time. And he, uh, and he sent it to Noel Gallagher. And to everybody's fucking amazement, Noel loved the song. Invited her down to London. We ended up signing a record deal. And within three weeks, I was going from playing social clubs, singing, you know, Mr. Brightside and Don't Look Back in Anger, to going to play all over the UK. Uh, singing my own song, so it was a it was a big drastic change. I'm so so pleased that it happened. I'm in such a good place with it. I'm I'm, I'm absolutely loving and um, totally grateful for the for the opportunity and the job that I'm doing. So long may it continue, mate. Unless the unless the old throat <laughs> gives up on us. And that's that, that's an absolutely amazing story there. And I'll certainly be asking you more about that in a minute. But I know you said um, you didn't really get into it until you were about eighteen, but. I know you said you were more interested in football, but had you always had the interest in like listening to music and everything before that? Uh, well, me, 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 me dad brought us up on a on a cocktail, let's say, of uh, like Paul Weller. So he was a massive jam fan. Yeah. Um, Glass Vegas, they were a really fucking really good band. Uh, bands like Ocean Colour Sea and the Beautiful South. But then he'd even love like Erasure and the Pet Shop Boys, and then of course he loved Oasis and Blur. Yeah. So I always had this kind of, you know cocktail of, of, of good music around us do you know what I mean it was never um if I was trying to compare the the music taste he have it, it, it would never if, if he was still around today he never would have been into the top 40 do you know what I mean it was always kind of good music that people could get along with so I always had that embedded in us of what kind of music if I was going to go into music I knew what kind of music I wanted to make I was never going to get in a studio and in 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 think Jesus Christ, what on earth am I going to do with these songs? You know what I mean? Because of the music I've been listening to, you know, since I was seven, eight years of age. So I suppose I was brought up on that kind of stuff. And like the Paul Weller thing in the in, in the whole 
sort of Noel Gallagher thing. He was a, he was a fan of Donovan. Um, so that's all singer songwriter stuff. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's all um, you know that's all meaningful songs and in, in, in hidden lyrics and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of what I pride myself on doing. You know, or, or, or what I try to do. So I think without that musical um, heritage that me that 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 me dad played a lot, I don't think I'd be making the music I am now. So I, I do own a lot for that. Um, speaking of influences again, do you ever look at Sam Fender current day and what he's done in your hometown of Newcastle, of course, and see like the backing he's got from the locals and everybody? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just yeah, I, I think that that's uh, one of the great things about this beautiful city that I come from. In the sense that if you're doing well, the crowd always get behind you. Do you know what I mean? I think you've seen it with the boxers that have came through. You've seen it with Paul Gascoigne. You've seen it with Alan Shearer, and, and and now you've seen it with Sam Fender. So you know, it it just goes to show that the togetherness and the love um, that that this city has uh, and the pride it has for the people that are doing well. You know, it's it's such a beautiful thing to see because you might see in other cities, uh, you know, somebody could be doing well who lives next door and you might be a little bit more bitter and you might think, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit jealous of him. But I think coming from Newcastle, uh, you know, if I was another, you know, see if I was doing something different and there was a musician across the road from me right now, you know, I'd be so, so proud of him. I wouldn't be jealous at all. So it's definitely a beautiful thing that we've got going on in the sea. Absolutely, because I, I'm actually only uh, from down the road from you. Um, I'm, I'm Teesside based and... Um... If, look, looking at the northeast as a whole, like including every, everywhere in the region, it's good to see people doing well because I think being from the place yourself, you'll probably know that we we, we haven't had as much success with like music artists and that in recent years. And, like Sam no, Bennett no. Brought through now and then you've got yourself, and it's like it's really good to see. And, like it's all good recognition for the area, and when you see somebody from this area doing well, it just feels really good. Well, it inspires others as well. Do you know what I mean? I mean, there's yeah, there's absolutely. loads of artists out there. I think I I was kind of doing my thing as Sam was breaking through. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I didn't have a lot of time to, to watch what he was doing and think I want to do that. It wasn't the case of that with me at all. Um, but I know loads of artists that have seen the success that he's had and thought, you know, I want to give this a go myself. You know, I think you're seeing the same sort of thing in the 90s with in in, in sort of like the Manchester and stuff when you know, you've got a band like Oasis. Come, how, how many bands do you go to see nowadays that, that just sound like Oasis, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and they'll be nine times out of ten, they're from Manchester as well. And it's not yeah. a bad thing. You know, some some so, so many people see it as a bad thing in, in, in wannabes and all that, but I, I generally don't. I just see it as, you know, you're proud of somebody that's came from your area and you're trying to replicate something that you've seen is successful and um and who knows mate give it 10 years that might be andrew cushion singers kicking about you know there, there might be a lot of people that think i'm F doing all right but fingers, um, fingers crossed yeah uh, fingers crossed i uh, fingers crossed i'm sure they can get a better fucking haircut though mate my hair's all over <laughs> at the minute like i'm just i'm catching me selling that little mirror and i'm thinking you ugly little bastard what the hell's <laughs> going on with this bonnet <laughs> um T -t -talk talking of that effect with things though I think like cause p people people class like you say people as wannabes but I see it as a good thing and it's inspiring um, it's people who've been inspired by other people who've done really well because like you touched upon the Manchester scene if you look at of course Oasis um, we're inspired by I know Liam loved Stone Roses Noel loved the Smiths and then you, you got Oasis and then the, the amount of Manchester bands that have followed from then on, it's sort of like a chain effect really, isn't it? Well, of course, and it, it works both ways, man. Like you look at you know bands like Kasabian and stuff. I think I think Tom Ansard came out on numerous occasions and said that if it wasn't for Liam and for Oasis, there wouldn't have been any Kasabian. Do you know what I mean? And then yeah. what bands have followed Kasabian? Do you know what I mean? So it's 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 an ongoing thing, man. If there was no Beatles, then the, you know, be no story. If the, you know, it's an ongoing thing. It's like. I think, um, but yeah, it's it's if if you're doing well, as you've said, like the Smiths, man. They, if there was no Smiths, no no may not have made the Oasis sound yeah, that he made, yeah. and, and and if there was no if there was no Stone Roses, Liam potentially wouldn't have been the front man that he was, and that led to Kasabian. You look at bands like the Arctic Monkeys and stuff. How many bands have came from that? You know, I think yeah, that, that's loads, man. That's loads. You could sit talking for hours of if what bands have led to other yeah, bands. I mean, it's, it's it's only a good thing. It's only a good. It, it's it's only a good thing. And then there's certain bands that you look at and think, well, if it wasn't for them, how many of these good bands would we not have had? But the next thing I want to ask you about, Andrew, is uh, I remember reading an interview with you in the Chronicle from last year, and I seen a really funny story about before you really got good. Well, you were into music, but before you really had a break, 
was it your mum who applied for you to be on the voice? Oh fucking hell, mate! I'll, I'll go in there, yeah, yeah. I got, yeah. Mate, I got kicked yeah, out the house for about. about it. Yeah, mate, I got fucking kicked out of the house for about a week for that. It was a pretty big argument, right? So basically, what had happened was, uh, I'd just done that gig, and um, it, it it wasn't the it, it it wasn't the work gig. It was the gig that Lee came to and sent the song to Noel Gallagher, right? So we were yeah. in the pipeline waiting to see what was going to happen. So we knew that Noel Gallagher had waiting for the rain, and I think Virgin EMI had it at the time as well, and we were waiting to see if they were going to buy. But I had, I, you know, I wasn't asked if they didn't. I was, I'd only done with three or four gigs, so um. So my mum, quite selfishly, uh, took Waiting for the Rain, that, that recording, and sent it to The Voice, sent it to the producers of The Voice, who then got in touch and invited her down to Nottingham. So she sent it on a Friday night, and, it, and they, they replied on Saturday morning, said, we, we love the songs, Andrew, want to come down and perform for the chairs? Do you know, the oh, oh. spinning chairs and all that bollocks. It's not for me. And uh, and she came into my room, she woke us up, and I was, I was lying in bed with my, with my lass at the time, and she, she, she woke us up, and she was like, right, come on, we'll get ready, we'll go down to fucking Nottingham. You, you, you're doing the voice. It may, it may have been somewhere else. I'm sure it was around about Nottingham. And I was like, there's, there's no way that I'm going to do the voice. Not, you know, not, not a chance. Uh, will I am, for one. I'm a fucking sitting and putting up that shit. <laughs> T- yeah, team Tom Will. Jones. Team Will. Team, fuck that, man. Could you imagine if he was the only one that would turn? Dude, G- Jesus I'd give up music, mate. <laughs> anyway, before we start slagging off, really famous artist. Um, it, 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 so I was nobody, I was going to do it. And it, we got into this massive argument at the point where I was going to ruin... You know this, this this chance I had. I was going to ruin this chance, and it would end up in a massive argument. I got told to leave the house, so I think I went and stayed at my nana's for a couple of nights. Lo and behold, a few nights later, we got a phone call off Mr. Noel Gallagher and a phone call off off, off the record label and whatever, inviting me down to London. And, you know, three weeks after that was signed record deal. I remember I got invited back into the house with open arms of like, you know, you definitely shouldn't have went on to the Voice. I was wrong, yeah. and I do apologise. But yeah, it's, don't it's, fucking it's, sign it's, us up to the Voice. That's that's just a lesson for anyone. Don't sign me up for the fucking Voice. You know, the the, the, the people that go on and they'll sing fucking Sweet Caroline. It's like, mm, you know, is there is there really a market for you? Yeah. You know, Darren forty seven from fucking. You know Norwich. <laughs> da, 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 Darren forty seven from Scunthorpe. Yeah, yeah. You know, but plumber by day, Neil Diamond by night. That sort of shit. It's like mm. Neil 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 Diamond tribute act. Hmm. Yeah. Um. So, t- talk me through the first time you spoke with Noel Gallagher. I mean, it's um. I, I bet just looking at like th- there's a voice and there's Noel Gallagher, and I bet you were just like, <laughs> thank, thank fuck I didn't do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I, I was no way I was going to do the voice, but yeah, he was he was great. He's 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 a he's a lovely bloke. He's he's a top. I haven't got I haven't got a bad way to say about Noel. He's uh, he's helped me a lot, and obviously producing was my family gone was a dream. I was able to when we done Rock and Roll Circus, I I, I seen him again obviously because he was he was headlining the gig and he came over to us and asked us how the songs were going, how the gigs were going. So he's a great great guy. He's still there if I ever need advice. We've got WhatsApp groups and stuff. I think the first time I spoke to him was it was a little bit surreal, of course it was, yeah. but um. But it was more so, and I, I was trying to sort of reiterate this the, the, this sort of point that it wasn't a case of um, totally being, you know, mind blown that I was sitting talking to Noel Gallagher. You know, I, I, I wanted to try and impress him because you know this this guy had, had expressed a lot of uh, faith in me to to push us forward to the record label, and I kind of wanted to like give something back to him. Do you know what I mean? So it was like when we were going to do this song. Yes, it was amazing. But I didn't want to crumble as well. I, I wanted to sing the best I could and I wanted to play the best I could and play him songs that, you know, we weren't going to record, but potentially record in the future and all that. So I was trying to impress him as well. It wasn't a case of being on the phone and just, you know, I wanted to lick his rim. It was like, it was a little bit more, you know, subdued of, okay, what, what are we doing in the studio? Thanks for giving me this opportunity. I'd like to send you this song, this song, this song. So I was, well, I was trying to sort of impress him as well as well as being respectful do you know what I mean but there wasn't a great deal of arseling going on <laughs> but do you, do you feel like as um, as he's been there do you feel like he's he's been like a big sort of like push factor and like his help like with advice and everything as well oh yeah yeah of course of course I remember I remember short, shortly after we um we had got out of the studio it was when I was just putting my band together because when we're done where's my family gone I thought we're never going to be able to recreate what we've done on this record with me and an acoustic guitar so I'm gonna have to get a band together and I think I, I remember I bought a little Fender amp in in the amp blue and I just didn't know why it had blown so I was able to give Noel a ring and he was talk he would talk us through why the amp had blown and what sentence to use and all that so even just little stupid things like that do you know what I mean it doesn't have to be anything major 
Um, he's been there to give us so much advice, so much advice, and we're still in contact with him now. You know, now and again, he's he's a very busy, busy chap, as you can well imagine. Um, but if there's anything that we really do need advice-wise, you know, he's he's always seemed to deliver. He's always seemed to deliver. And I think, you know, equally with those with those guys, we we done a few gigs with with uh, Paul Weller, and he was just the same. You know, I I, I sat and had me sort of scanning that with him after one of the gigs and. He's exactly the same. Like, if there's any any advice that you know needs giving, he was talking with through record labels and all that kind of stuff, and, and, and what to watch out for, and what to, you know what to really try and tap into and stuff like that. So, all all of the guys that have been around for longer than thirty years, the ones that I've met, have all been sound as fucking full of advice, which is good. Which is good. I haven't came across too many arrogant people yet, which is nice. Yeah, that, that's always a good thing because I, I, sometimes pe- people say the quote, "It's who you know as well." Because uh, being, of course, being in a different profession to you since I've started this and everything, a big, a big factor in me, um, like, sort of l- reaching a higher level to like get bigger guests on was through. I know you're a big football fan, so Neil, Neil Ruddock, um, okay, well, ex defender, because he, he he came on and basically we done our episode. Then he said to me after he appreciates what I'm doing at my age and that, so he gave me his phone number and then he. I know you've been a big Newcastle fan. Hero for you will be Alan Shearer. And another mm-hmm. one was Jamie Redknapp and he like, introduced me to them and everything and got them to Okay, play. so you've, you've had, you've, you've had like, Shearer on that one as well? Yeah, she... she fucking class. She, she, Shearer came on last May and that, that, that was really surreal. Wow. Like, yeah, that, mate, that's, that's special. That man, he's, he's, like, he's, he's just the toon hero, isn't he? Like, he'll just yeah. forever be the hero. I can't yeah, see that record ever getting beaten. How, how old's Harry Kane now? 29? He's what he's got. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's about ninety away, isn't he? Or something like ninety away. I sort of hope Harry Kane gets shipped off abroad somewhere. So yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd, 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 I'd like to think that he wouldn't catch it, like, but he's, he's definitely, he's in, he's in a good position. If he plays till yeah, he's thirty-five he's, and he can average, you know, twenty goals a season, then it's going to be done, going up there. Yeah, it, I, I think he'll, he'll, he's, he's going to be a close second. But. Yeah, absolutely. Because I was when when he introduced me to the people, he did it like helped me bring the level of the podcast up and like not like you say with Noel Gallagher and Paul Weller. For me, like the likes of Shearer and Redknapp were just brilliant and everything. So I think sometimes it's who you know, and it's great to have these people there. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So another one for you, uh, Pete Doherty. He was, um, he's been a big influence on you as well, hasn't he? With like a bit of a friendship. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Um, we we first, it was our first or my first gig. It was a solo gig. It was a, uh, it was my first gig out of the lockdown, and was supporting Peter at the Riverside in the castle. It was like a last minute thing. And um, and I remember he came down and watched some of the songs from the side of the stage, and he just he he, he said he loved it. Uh, we'd done about another three shows, and I think by gig number two, uh. I think, I think we've done four shows and by gig number two or three, it was when it, his manager, who also runs the record label with him, that's, that, that's when they were really quite interested. And then we worked something out. I'm having a great time at Strap. I've got loads of freedom and stuff like that. We've got the next two songs coming out at the end of October as well. So that'll be good. Uh, but uh, Peter's been great. And it, it, one thing I love is that whenever the Liberty, obviously we've done a couple of gigs with the Libs and stuff now. Uh, I've done a couple of gigs with Carl as well. Like, they're, they're, again, like all the boys been around for, you know, sort of 20 plus years, they're, they're Great, all of them great, full, yeah. full of mint advice. Um, but all the gigs that we've done and festivals that we've done with the Libertines, I've always found sort of Peter kicking around somewhere. So we've done Bingley Festival, and during, I think it was after like the first song, Peter just came and sat down right at the front of the stage and just watched the full gig. So he definitely shows so much interest, man, and he's a yeah. lovely dude. I was able to stay on his on on his night bus and stuff with him for a couple of nights, and while doing the uh, solo shows, which was great. It was just eye opening. First time I've been on a sleeper bus and. You know, staying up the early hours of the morning, getting absolutely mortal drunk with guitars and that. It was just great. It was great. He's given us so much advice as well. But again, it just reiterates the fact that, you know, I've said every, all, all the older boys, or they might not like us calling them older boys, if you know what I mean, but it, all, the ex- all, ex- all the older ex- lads. The experienced. The experienced boys, yeah, let's, let's, all right, let's use that one. The experienced boys, they, they've all given us loads of advice, mate. They've all been sound. Yeah. They've all been absolutely class, right? which is good, which is good. It's, it's worked wonders for me. And as you say, that's absolutely fantastic for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great class. Yeah. Um, they've 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 all helped us along loads. Helped along loads. I've I've been inspired to write. I've been inspired to gig more. It's great. It's great. I want to talk about writing now because we're gonna go we're gonna go back to February 2020 with the release of your first single. 
it's going to get better. How did it feel getting that out into the world as your first official single? Um, it was it was good and it, it was needed as well because we had just, if I remember rightly, I think we had sold out the Clooney, which is um, it's, anybody that's not from Newcastle, it's a little venue new. I think it's about three, three hundred, three fifty. But that gig sold out in about six days. It was amazing. I'd never done a headline gig before. I got signed about four, five months prior to that. Never, never done really a gig in Newcastle. So then, you know, coming back and in, in, in selling out the Clooney was amazing. So it was important to have a song out by then. Um, but looking back, there's things I would have done differently with those two songs. You know, it's that typical thing of if I know, if I knew them, what I know now, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, for instance, uh, if there's many musicians and stuff watching this, which I'm, I'm so sure there will be. Those songs were never played to a click or anything like that. They were literally just done live. So all the tracking on them, on the drums and stuff is, um, you know, it, it had to be so tight, uh, which is why there's, the drums aren't all the way through, because I just don't think you'd be able to drum all the way through. Um, so I, I'd like to eventually go back and redo those songs. Uh, it's going to get better and Waiting for the Rain. Those were the first two. So I would like to go and do them. I think Waiting for the Rain was, was a gem from when I first wrote it at 16. Still love that song. And the way we play it now, a little bit quicker and a, a, bit, a bit more full band is the way I'd like to record it. So I think we'll go back and redo them. But of course it was important getting them out because yeah. you know you don't want to be going to do a, a home headline gig and nobody actually knows your songs. Um, so it was nice to have the crowd singing. I think that was the first time I'd had the crowd singing my songs back to us, which was, you know, a really surreal moment. Um, it was, it was a, yeah, it was a, it was a special day, that one. It was a special day. So was that, was that a gig played quite soon after the release of It's Gonna Get Better? Yeah, I think it was March. If I, if I, if I think back, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it was March. I'm sure it was the beginning of March. I know it was like the week or two weeks before the lockdown yeah. hit. Because I think I was it was around about then. It was, was it was like ask, one of the last shows. So I was going to ask you, Andrew, actually, how, how did you find lockdown? Because you, of course, released that single. Did you find it frustrating? Because obviously you'd played a gig and you wanted to get out and play more. Did it bring bring on more ideas for writing and time to get down and work um, on some more songs? Well, I wrote a lot. I mean, I, I wrote Memories in that time. I think Where's My Family Gone was already written. I wrote the full... I wrote two songs from the AP that were released just this year so I wrote You Don't Belong and Catch Me If You Can um, I'm trying to think what else I wrote that would play in this set now I think I wrote Four and a Half Percent around then as well which is another you know Touch Your Heart song sort of thing so I've done a lot of writing but then also without the lockdown Noel Gallagher wouldn't have had the time off to record Where's My Family Gone because we'd done the song uh, around about the October time I think it was yeah um or it might be in September. So we recorded the song when all in lockdown. So I think if the lockdown didn't come, then I wouldn't be able to do that. In you know, it, you see so many people, I think like a band like the Lathams and stuff are a great example of a band that grafted through lockdown yeah. and got the fucking rewards out of it. You know what I mean? It's a prime example of showing, you know, you get out of it what you put in it. I remember seeing them grafting all the way through lockdown, doing uh, sort of ticketed online gigs and you know yeah, there was a, there was a lot live yeah. live covers and all that kind of stuff. So they really worked hard. And in I think anybody that didn't work hard in the lockdown but complained about it, you've only really got yourself to blame, do you know what I mean? Because there was work to be done. Of course, yeah. you're sitting in the house, but you've still got all the socials. I mean, we've done gigs for, I think we've done live gigs for Aqua Scutum, for Ben Sherman, done something for Scott. Um, I think we've oh, we, we done a few. I think Ed Sheeran's got a clothing brand that we've done something for. That was loads anyway. We've done, we done, we done loads of the live gigs. I went out and done as many photo shoots as I can to flood the socials with things. We were doing loads of promo for the Noel Gallagher stuff. So even though I was in the house and Lamy manager was in his house, we were still graphing between us. Do you know what I mean? Which That's I think that. is what gave us such a good head start when we got out of lockdown because then we went straight back on tour and they were well sold in the in the were well received gigs and everybody knew the songs by then, which is good. But I think if we had to just sat on our arse in the lockdown, I think I'd be eighteen months behind what I am now. Absolutely. I think although it was a shit time for everybody, I think people did work. I mean, for myself as well, this is this is when I got all of this stuff started in lockdown the podcast and everything and then you see many musicians this year that have really because there's been so many albums out this year people have worked and obviously looking back now a lot like it was a shit time when it happened people have got positives out of it haven't they yeah of course i mean you look at you look at artists like is it uh, mimi webb and stuff from tiktok who, who is now you know fucking smashing it 
all because of the social media game, and it's like fair yeah. play. You couldn't you, you you couldn't go and gig, so you've used the one avenue you could, and you and you've and you've totally smashed it. So fair play. But yeah, I've got I've. I lost so much respect when we came out of lockdown when I was talking to bands and stuff on the road and they'd say, you know, we didn't do anything in lockdown and then they'd be disappointed that they're not further on. It's like, well, you know, it doesn't matter that you sat in the fucking house, you've wasted 18 months, yeah. regardless if you were allowed to go walk your dog or not. You know, there was still stuff to do. Absolutely. There was always, there was always something there for people to work on. Yeah, precisely. Precisely, yeah. I want to talk about your writing style now, Andrew, because, of course... Um, I remember you saying before in another interview that you've um, written a lot about own experiences almost. Is that what you base your writing style on, like past experiences and like own? Uh, I did I did early on, uh, more so because there was just so much shit going on in my life that it was just like either go and speak to a therapist, go out and take a load of drugs and forget about shit, or pick up the guitar and write songs about it, do you know what I mean? So obviously I chose the latter, thankfully. Uh, I'm not a person that can go and talk to people about stuff like that. You know, I, I'm lucky that I've got a couple of mates that, you know, if I do have a little breakdown once in a while, I, I can rely on them to kind of pick us back up. I've got a good family. Um, but at, at that time, it was like I didn't want to fucking talk to anybody. So, the, you know, some of the people that were referring to my music is morbid music and stuff. It was like, you know, I can take that. That's, that's fucking fair enough. But if I didn't write those songs, fuck knows where I would have been. Do you know what I mean? I apologise for the language, but I, I, I really don't know where I would have been. I'm out of that bad place now to an extent. So some of the songs that are coming around are things like You Don't Belong and like Yeah, Yeah, Yeah and Catch Me If You Can, which if you break down the lyrics, they're still pretty maudlin lyrics, but I'm not I'm not delivering them in that kind of way anymore. Do you know what I mean? I'm trying to build the music. I'm trying to make it a little bit more joyous and a little bit more moving uh, in terms of people moving, not moving in the fucking, you know, whatever sense that means. So I'm, I'm, try I'm trying to get people moving is the point I'm trying to uh, make. Um so yeah I'd, I'd in the early days definitely writing the morbid songs and delivering them in that way but now I, i'm trying to i'm I'm trying to happy myself up a bit let's, yeah. let's put it there i'm trying to happy Bring, myself bringing up a bit. the tempo that's it that's it because it's just as i say about it I, I got into music for all of the for all the right reasons yeah. Right, you know, you get in, in, and that's such a cliche thing to say, but I really did. Like, I, I didn't get into it and make money, I got into it because because of the love for what you because of the have, love, yeah. Well, precisely, yeah. I mean, I started doing music like because of, I think I've said for the 50 quid, of course, I started doing it for that, but then I carried it on through that shit time and stuff. I could easily, you know, just you know, um, just gave up after all the shit was going on. Could have easily done it, but I carried on because I felt I had something to say, and I wanted everybody to hear what I said. And the more songs I was I was singing at gigs, and the more personal songs I was singing at gigs, the more times that I'd get people coming over. It was at the end of them. Some people would be, you know, in their fifties and their sixties, and they'd be coming up really feeling a song that I'd wrote as a as a nineteen year old and getting emotional by it. And I thought I'm 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 making these people feel something, so I'm doing this for the right reasons. So that's something that kept us going on with it. And then we've built, we've kind of built a fan base on that, which is now why I'm trying to make it a little bit more joyous as well. So those people can come to the gigs, they can have a good cry, but I also want people jumping around like a fucking lunatic as well by yeah, the end of it. Do you know what bit, I mean? A bit of a mosh pit. That's it. Well, you just want the, you, you want to find a yeah. fine line, don't you? You can have people cry in three or four songs in, but by the finish, you want them going home with a smile on their face. Yeah, yeah. So that's, 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 that's what we're trying to achieve. Absolutely. And... Talk, talking about you coming out of lockdown, you had your first headline tour, which is probably just, it was September 2021, so just gone a year really, hasn't it? How was that for you, your first headline tour, of course, a sold out show at the boiler shop in Newcastle, which yeah, I yeah. amazing. It was it was great, it was great. Uh, I think we, saw, we sold out Manchester, which was amazing. Um, we sold out Newcastle, obviously. I mean, the Newcastle show was ridiculous, like a thousand people, that was just... It was just unbelievable. Had the confetti cannons and stuff going on. It was, yeah, it was just ridiculous. And then even the other shows that I think we played, Scunthorpe, I think we played Leeds. There was, there was a few. I really, I, I enjoyed them. It was, it was the first, first experience I'd had of getting out on the road and all that kind of stuff. And some of the venues were little independent venues, like just really, it's really small. You know, it was great. I mean, we played, we played in Sunderland. Uh, the night before, and we did fill it with a load of Toon fans as well. By the way, I did. There was a little bus come along from the castle. Um, <laughs> it, it was it was a little venue called Independent, which I think we're going to play again in December. And um, 
in it, it was it was it was mint. It was like so narrow and hot and sweaty. And then the day after, we played in the castle in this big massive room with a thousand people. And then the week later, we went and played in Leeds to like eighty five people. And then the week later, we played in Manchester three hundred. And then you know twenty people in score. So it was mint. It was yeah. mint. It was just so it was it was such an experience that you can be you can be doing really well in, in one area and then you know you've still got a bit of graft to do in the next which is good which is why i'm really looking forward to this to this october too and why it's been so interesting seeing the sales of of where i i am successful and where Compare. i still need to work on yeah. precisely and i think we're probably going to go on another tour maybe at the back end of the year as well and we'll do some of the cities that we haven't done you know places like hull in, in you know that you know you've got like your blackburns and your stoke and your, you know your places that people don't often go to but they still need ticked off the off the little checklist so I think we'll probably do them later in the year as well so that'll be good you, you need to get yourself down to Middlesbrough yeah well I think we're, we've done Stockton a few times that's that's, that's not far from you yeah, is it Stock, Stockton uh, uh, where, where, where did you play in Stockton was it we've done the Q bar which Q-bar, is good yeah that, get, that gets a lot of uh, that yeah oh, we've done that I think I think we're looking at doing the Georgian Theatre at some point as well. Yeah, that's, that's this is all just speculation, yeah. but there's a few, there's a few, few good ones. There's some decent venues in Hull, in 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 Middlesbrough, sorry. And then you've got the, was it the Town Hall? The Town. Uh, yeah, I've seen Paul Weller there last last December. Yeah, yeah. That's a fantastic venue. It doesn't get as many acts as it pos- probably should do, but it's it's a very good venue. And there's the Empire next to it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's another one. That's another one. Well, I mean, the Empire is huge, and that's where the uh, Cortinas and stuff played, didn't they? Yeah, it actually only holds about five hundred, but it's sort. Of, oh, does it really? I yeah, thought it was about two thousand that venue. It was fucking out five hundred. It's because I know I know they've got the the ratings going there in December, uh-huh. which mm-hmm. um should, should be a good one. But yeah, there's a couple of good venues in Middlesbrough, but just hopefully they can start to like bring um the acts in a bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's class, That's class. Well, yeah, we'll have to have a little look at playing in the borough. Me, yeah. uh, me, uh, granddad's from um from a Middlesbrough and my keyboard player is a big Middlesbrough fan so I'm sure they'd love that I will be wearing a tune top as I will yeah. whenever oh, we play I, I, I don't blame you I don't blame you so uh, yeah so if there's any if there's any Borough fans wanting to come to the gig just fucking beware of that there will be a tune top on stage <laughs> I, th- I think you might have to try a Parmo as well. Have you ever had one? Before? Yeah, I've heard I've heard loads about yeah. them. Loads of them. I've never, I've never had one. Are there, are there specialist people talk about? It's it, it, it's like a chicken breast, which has then got yeah, vegetable yeah. sauce and then cheese. Right. If, if, and 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 other as special as everybody says, I. If if you go to the right place. Yeah. Right. Okay. You got to be okay. like the right the the right one the right. Because that sounds kind of sickly to me. To be yeah, honest, that, is, that sounds quite yeah. sickly. You'd have the yeah, shits it, in the morning with that. There's only a certain amount that you can eat before you're like, oh, I can't eat any more of this. Ah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I would I, 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 would, I would like to try one. I mean, my, yeah. my, um, my manager hasn't hardly pulled quite a bit, and he, 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 he tends to get them quite quite yeah. a little bit. But well, yeah, I'll have to have a go. When you get yourself down, I think you'll have to try one. But what I want to talk about next is um, April this year you released the EP You Don't Belong, which of course featured that as a title track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't catch me, catch me if you can and run away. So um, do you want to speak a little bit about that? How did that come about? Because I know you spoke about the joyous. Um, yeah, well, that was it. And I think especially well, if you listen to Catch Me If You Can, You Don't Belong. And yeah, 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 it's like more of a like up temp, more up tempo songs and like probably like what you've said. Yeah, well, that's it, man. It's like. Um... Uh, they've actually been received really well in terms of Spotify and all that stuff, which is good as well because I was very apprehensive on releasing them because obviously the other stuff was like you said the more the, the stuff that I'd written a little while ago when I was in that dark place and I was kind of thinking am I going to be tarnished with this brush of he only writes those kind of songs, so I wanted to release something on Strap. It was a it was obviously a fresh start signing that record deal and I wanted to uh, I wanted to release something fresh and something that I hadn't done before. So You Don't Belong was written, but it was written as an acoustic song. My uh, old guitarist put a, put that you know dun, 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 kind of riff on, yeah. which we loved. So we used that as, as, as like the repetitive thing. Uh, Catch Me If You Can wasn't even going to be on the EP till we got in the studio. And it was the back and vocals that made me think, OK, that could be something pretty special in a big, yeah, in a big room. Lot. Yeah, and then yeah, yeah, yeah was was again just like a filler track that I fell in love with, you know. But they were all upbeat songs. And I was kind of thinking this is fucking great, but I wanted to keep a little bit of my soul in the EP. So Runaway, I, uh, more, yeah. I well that's it. Yeah, I I I just I challenged myself one day. I, I sat down with the guitar, 
and uh, it was about two days before we went to the studio and you know my manager on the label was kind of badgering us what 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 song do you want to play on the lot because we need to know and i went just fuck it, just leave it. i'll have one by the time we get there and um and i sat down with the guitar and i and i said to i sent my manager i said whatever i write today doesn't matter if it's brilliant or shit that's what's going on the ep i took a kind of um it was a, it was a, I mean, I, I know that Noel done it a few times, didn't he? Where he like sat down, and he was like, right, okay, whatever I write now, this is what we do. And then he goes on yeah. to write fucking supersonic, or he goes on to write, you know, some might say or whatever. So I tried to take the same sort of thing. I'm not saying Runaways as good as those fucking songs, by the way. <laughs> by the way. But I sat down and within like 20 minutes, I rang him and said, right, I've got it. It's called Runaway. Uh, it's very, it's very downbeat. It's got probably the, the the same chord structure throughout the whole fucking song, which is you know something which does do me heading because I could have I could experiment with it a little bit more, but um, but it's great. It's 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 quite a heartfelt song. Um, it, it, it's just about sticking by someone. That's that's all that song's about. It's about sticking by someone that's down and out, uh, whether that be a, an alcoholic or a drug addict or somebody depressed. It's just about you know you just can't run away from them. Uh, you know. You've you've just got to stick by the ones that you love, and that and that's all it's about. And I thought, what a great way to finish the EP. Do you know what I mean? After yeah. taking people on this joyous journey of, you don't belong, and catch me if you can, and yeah, yeah, where you can dance and you can listen to the lyrics, and you know you've got that hook bass riff and catch me if you can. I thought, what a nice way to end the EP, with something massively fucking morbid. <laughs> because I, I I think it's a fantastic EP myself. I mean, I, I caught you live at Hardwick Festival, which was um, a good day. Wasn't so good after you finished because I imagine if she stayed around for the day, it fucking pissed it down. Ah, uh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. But um, hearing them songs live was absolutely fantastic. Oh, thank you very much, man. It was it was a stressful one. My my guitarist uh, was away for his brother's wedding that day, so the week before. I had to get a new guitarist, and he had to learn like eleven yeah, songs in seven days. Yeah, yeah. I mean. It, it, for instance, I think I think I'd done about four acoustic songs in that set. I was if I had I had my normal guitarist, I only would have done one. It, but we just didn't have the time frame to get the other guy learning another three songs. So we just had to deal with what we had, really. But it, I, I think it worked. I think it was a great gig. I enjoyed it. Uh, fingers crossed we can come back again soon. But yeah, it was it was it was enjoyable. And I'm pleased I had that big stupid yellow jacket on because it was waterproof. And obviously the rain did not come down, which was a bit of a pain in the arse. Did you did you did you come out into the fields after as well? Oh yeah, I always do. I always come out yeah. in the fields. I, I I love it. I I normally give it about an hour. Uh, I was it was a pretty big crowd when, but by the time that we finished, and I I came out, and um and I, I think people started forming a queue and stuff, and they wanted things signed and photos and stuff, which you know I, I absolutely love doing all that kind of stuff. It's 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 so nice to meet people. But when you just get off stage, sometimes you do need to give yourself 10, 15 minutes. So I think I signed everybody's stuff, got a couple of photos, went back, gave myself about half an hour. I think I had a nap to be truthfully honest, went and got yeah. some food, and then as everybody calmed down and stopped giving a shit who I was, that's when I came out in the field and say, like, oh, there's Andrew Cush, and then I, say, I, I couldn't give a fuck, you know, sort of Jake Bugs playing now, just concentrate yeah. on him. <laughs> so that's yeah but i i i kicked about watch a bit of stereophonics i think it got a little bit too rainy and too cold for me by yeah. the time i left yeah i think i think i think i think the jake bug spell was the worst that day because by, by the time stereophonics were on it, it stopped a little bit but everybody was, the damage was already done every everybody was already piss wet yeah. talking so i don't think anybody was bothered uh yeah. but yeah I, I think um i mean the crowd considering the rain for uh, Jake, the crowd was amazing. Like oh, I, 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 I stood yeah. right down the front. Somebody got a photo with me with a bottle of brown ale in a in a vape in my hand, <laughs> hanging <laughs> over the gate watching Jake Bug, and you can just see I'm fucking drenched. But yeah. it, was, it was good. I, I love yeah, I, I, I love Hobbit. We played we we played it last year and we opened the main stage, and it was nice to come back this year and do it as a special guest. It was it was definitely one of the more enjoyable gigs that I've done in a while. And it's still quite close to home as well, isn't it? So. Well, that's it. It almost feels like yeah. a homecoming gig when you do those yeah. when you do those kind of uh, shows. Because I mean, it's only in Sedgefield, you know what I mean? It's only forty minutes away. Yeah, it's not far. Um, absolutely, and that that leads me because I want I want to now touch upon the tour again. Now, fourteen days. I'm hoping I can get down to the Newcastle gig at the NX. I think it is. So, um, do you want to tell tell a bit more again about how you're looking forward to the tour and getting back out on the road? Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be amazing. We start in Leeds, uh, obviously finishing the castle. Um, I think if anybody's watching this that wants to get tickets, I think Liverpool's nearly done, so you've got to be quick for that one. Sheffield's got to be quick for Glasgow, Brighton. Um, 
uh, Leeds is nearly at about, you know, I think Leeds is, is, is on the cusp now. Uh, and obviously, I mean, the big one is the uh, Newcastle show. So that's going to be amazing. I think we've got, we're down to definitely the last 10% for that Newcastle show now. We've got another special guest to be announced, which might be out by the time that we do this show or by the time that this comes out. Um, it's going to be absolutely ridiculous. I can't wait to get on tour. I can't wait to see everybody again. I hope I have a massive sing song. I'm, I'm going to be off the drink, which is going to... I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a pisshead. I'm not an alcoholic. But I'm going to be off the drink to look after the voice. So if you do want to come see what afterwards, you know, the band are definitely going to be more fun than I am. I'm going to be sitting sulking in the corner with me little throat tablets. So that's going to be a bit of a big miss. But I am really looking forward to getting back on the road. And um, yeah, hopefully see you all there. What, what's the next plan? Is that um, first full debut album? Yeah, we do. We start doing the album in November, I believe, which is going to be pretty special. So that'll be out 2023. I can, I can definitely confirm that. It's going to be fucking amazing. All the songs are nigh on there. We just need to start recording it. We're going to be working um, with a great producer who I love working with. I'm not going to give any names. You know, you don't want to put Spanner in the works just yet. But if, if we work with a guy I want to, he's, he's a fucking genius. Um, we've also got more gigs in November. I believe I'll be going around Europe again towards the end of it, which is going to be pretty special. And then um, December, hopefully going back on the road as well. Fantastic. Andrew, I uh, just want to say thank you very much for coming on to chat today. It's been a pleasure.